Can we see the end of COVID-19 on the landscape? I think we can. If so, it means the lockdowns are doing a lot more harm than good. Hello, everyone. Dr. Chris Martinson here. It's August 4th, 2020. I am recording this as the remnants of a tropical storm are moving overhead, so hopefully all of this goes well and according to plan. Very quickly, because I want to move past these, the numbers for August 4th, 2020 is uh, 18 million known cases across the world, nearly 700,000 deaths. And as we look at this, we see that the deaths are still uh, moving in a upward sort of a direction there. And uh, that's just because we have a lot more cases going on around the world. But I want to present to you the idea that we can see an end to this. And this is a theory. We're going to explore it, but it's one that increasingly makes a lot of sense to me. All right. So to before we go there, remember the SARS-2 balancing act here has always been between one, two, and three. Number one, stop the pandemic, right? So you want to get that r naught below one, use your non-pharmaceutical interventions or NPIs or tight containment, the isolation actions, all of that. Hey, this stuff all makes sense. Why? Because you want to jump to number three here. You want to keep your hospitals working. You need to keep the infection levels below those which swamp the hospitals. And it uh, looks like maybe Florida is close to swamped at this point in time. As you get that first wave moving through, that's what you really need to control is just how quickly that moves through your population. But you have to balance all that against number two, which is to keep the economy going and uh, or you get as bad an outcome and, and let's define outcomes. Uh, what would that be? Death. Uh, we know that more people tend to commit suicide when they're facing poverty or eviction or things like that. We know that um, uh, people who can't access certain social services, medical services, uh, support systems, people who are lonely. All, there's all sorts of reasons that uh, you have bad outcomes when we're not able to get up and around and live our lives. So the balancing act has always been between number one over here, number three on over this side, and you got to keep number two working. I'm here to argue that we're doing a bad job in the United States, maybe elsewhere too, about managing uh, number two here at this point in time. And so here's how this thinking goes. First, I'm going to disagree once again with Fauci. I seem to be doing this a lot uh, at this point. He says there's no end in sight for COVID-19. I actually think there is an end in sight, and we're going to show you uh, the data for that. And as well, I'm going to disagree with the WHO, WHO, but perhaps just reflexively at this point, because the winning shot on goal with respect to the WHO has been to just use, say the opposite of whatever they're saying. And that's pretty much been the right course of action so far. It's astonishing how how off how, how off they've been this whole way. Uh, the WHO chief or um, head manager can't call him a chief. There might never be a silver bullet for coronavirus. All right. Well, I'm going to take exception with that as well. And uh, the silver bullet may well just be our own natural immunity and things like that. So this is a complicated story. It's got multiple moving pieces. It's not black or white. Is it good or bad? All that. But here's here's where the good news is centered in. Um, I've been following COVID-19 Crusher. That's at COVID-19 Crusher here on Twitter. And uh, he, he's been making, this person's been making a series of observations. And one of them looks like this. Let it rip. On May 4th, Armenia decided to put an end to the economically unbearable lockdown. Contagion skyrocketed. Two months later, new cases are in free fall. Pandemic is running out of susceptible targets. More evidence of COVID-19 herd immunity at a low threshold. So a number of points to consider there. What is the herd immunity threshold? Can, is this thing moving through the population faster than we think? So it actually runs out of susceptible targets. But good point made here. Look at this. You have this. This just looks like the end of the world here. And then... For whatever reason, you just see the cases starting to come back down again. Um, here we have a case study in two different uh, countries. So we can see here um, that uh, Mauritania had just sort of did the Armenian thing, let it rip. And this is where uh, their experience is. Morocco has been doing much more heavy-handed lockdowns. And you can see they're still fighting through what's probably their first wave. They, you fight, you fight, you fight, you fight, you fight, you fight, and then the honey badger virus gets the best of you anyway. And so the argument being made here is that there's just a certain number of cases you are going to experience. Here's some more data for that. Um, it comes and then it goes. You see here, this is New York, U.S. New Northeast right here, New York, Connecticut, all that. 
had their bad wave. It was way back here in March. All these other states, they weren't doing a better job. They just hadn't gotten their first wave yet, but now they're getting their first wave. So you see the U.S. West here, but it's already started to crest. You can see here the U.S. South, and it's already started to crest here. And the U.S. Midwest, maybe it's cresting too. Don't know that yet. Um, but you see this pattern over and over and over again, all over the world. And so when we look more specifically at New York, we can say, now nah, there's probably not going to be a second wave. I mean, look at this, right? That shape of that chart, we see that all over the place. Maybe we see it in London as well. Same thing. Pretty bad outbreak in London. And then now it's down and look at that approaching zero new cases. So originally when we were looking at this thing with an R naught of between five and six, which is its native R naught of this particular honey badger virus, you would say, okay, you need a herd immunity threshold of maybe 80%. That's what we thought at the beginning. That's what um, the herd, herd immunity math tells you. Yeah, about 80% need to be infected. But you can dial that back for a couple of reasons. One, um, there are super spreaders. So once your super spreaders have already gotten it, well, they're not super spreaders anymore, presuming they are now immune. Secondarily, we're seeing a lot of people coming down with COVID who are asymptomatic entirely. They test positive, no symptoms, doesn't really seem to be affecting them. Uh, so maybe it's hitting a lot more people than we know. So there are people guaranteed who have been asymptomatic the whole way, never got tested. So we don't even count them in the overall counts at this point in time. Uh, and then finally, the overall uh, herd immunity may be around something we can't really measure well yet. So antibodies, that zero prevalence, how prevalent in the serum of people are these antibodies? That's one part of the story. Mm, the tests have been a little bit faulty. They're getting better. But guess what? A lot of people may be immune to SARS-2, the honey badger virus, without having antibodies at all because of the T cell immunity that they could have. Uh, the CD4, the CD8 cells, all of that. That story we covered a bit. So here's how we build the argument for that. Let's notice here that in London, where we see this case and, and crushing like that, that's, this is what you would expect to see here if you had herd immunity. The cases just don't spread anymore. They're, it's already run through everybody who's susceptible. There aren't enough susceptible people to sustain something that looks like that, a second wave coming through. Well, here's the seroprevalence data such as we have, and I don't think it's perfect, but it's maybe close enough. This is all across the, the London area here. And you can see that there's a maximum of a detected range of about 19% on this top bar right here, but this is the average of, of this test series right here came out at about, let's call it just under 16%. This one's around 10%. These are all under 10%, uh, ranging from maybe 4, 5, 6, 7. So somewhere between, say, 4% and 16% is the highest these uh, seroprevalence levels got in London, even though uh, you can see whoop, London's already, um, oops, sorry, wrong one. London's already gone up and down this whole case. Same thing when we go to Spain. Look, uh, I mean, sorry, in Italy, we look at the uh, Lombardy region here. And um, we see the same exact pattern again, like this. And uh, I mentioned Spain because we saw the same pattern as well in Spain, uh, a very similar profile for new cases. And in Spain, we looked at their seroprevalence a few weeks back, pulling up that uh, chart again, that slide. We see here that their seroprevalence also never really cracked 15% here. I think, what's the high here? We got to 13.6% right here. And that's it. So um, this is the most populated region here in the center of Spain. And their seroprevalence were all under 15%. All right. So this brings us to, um, let's talk about countries that really put the lockdown uh, hard, like Australia. Australia did a, uh, a great case here of really putting the lockdown hard. They had an explosion in case. They just shut everything down, had all their cases under control. But now look at them again. Here they go. And the argument to be made here is that they just simply have a first wave to go through. They just didn't go through this whole first spike and reach that level of herd immunity. And uh, because of that, then we see that Australia is actually experiencing really a delayed first wave. If they had just let everything run, it might have looked uh, more like this, right, um, and gone up earlier, and all these people under here would have been infected too. So that's the argument being made here, and we can look at the remarkable example of Sweden, again, from COVID-19 crusher saying here, Sweden, where the government does not want you to wear a mask so that herd immunity is reached faster, exhibiting a remarkable second wave of harmlessness that never registered against the constant decline in death. So 
this is the good news. The deaths in Sweden come up and they come down and they're just, they're just heading down, even though there was a pretty large uptick in cases right here. So again, the argument here is that whoever caught this earlier was more susceptible and more uh, susceptible to death and mortality. All right. So interesting that we see this huge spike in cases over here for Sweden, and we're not seeing any corresponding bump in deaths that we would expect to see that would look something like that. So what is this main theory? The main theory is that sporting a native r naught of five or six, you can't really stop the honey badger virus. It's going to have its way with your population. That's what's going to happen. It's just going to find its way through your population. Your job is to make sure it doesn't go so fast that you swamp your hospital system. But other than that, there's really nothing you can do to stop something that's this transmissive and transmissible. And by the way, I think Asia's got a second run at this because they didn't have the D614G mutation. They had an earlier version. I think the earlier version was milder. It didn't uh, jump host quite as easily from person to person. D614G does. I think they're gonna have another run at the uh, virus because of that on that new strain. However, Carrying on here, COVID-19, it strikes a low proportion hard and the rest of the population, not so much. And it means that herd immunity happens relatively quickly. And maybe when we're only seeing maybe 15% zero prevalence for a variety of reasons, again, maybe 45% of the people are asymptomatic. Maybe they don't develop hardly any antibodies, if any. Maybe uh, there's an automatic immunity that some people have. Hey, young people, almost completely immune to this thing. Uh, almost completely, not entirely. And of course, uh, that you know, the asterisk on that particular statement is young people without any other significant comorbidities. We're hearing cases of young people, some very young people tragically dying. Many of them were immunocompromised. They were organ transplant um, uh, patients at one point in time. They, they had cancer, something like that uh, seems to be fairly typical. But at any rate, that's the theory. Uh, you're not going to stop this thing. Honey badger is just going to sweep on through. It's going to uh, sweep on through no matter what you do. But you're going to end up with a chart that looks like this for London, this for Italy, uh, this for New York State, on and on and on. We're seeing this particular um, shape over and over and over again. And this is independent of which country we're in, what their genetic factors are, what kind of mask usage they put down. The only thing we can tell you is that if you go in through a hard lockdown, all you did was hold that wave off for a little bit, but as soon as you take your foot off the brake a tiny bit, that honey badger virus comes roaring back out of the gate and um, has its way with your population. All right, so that's the good news because that means we can see the end of this. The, we have slightly less good news around this. Okay, so the sort of good news is that mortality is predictable and low. So this was a pretty cool paper just came out shows uh, 9,519 cases with a positive PCR test for SARS-CoV-2 in Denmark. So just running through the data, 9,500 cases plus. And uh, so what, what do we see? They had a couple of cool charts in there. First, age plus comorbidities are the main factors. Over here on the y-axis, we have age groups in 10-year um, in, uh, periods, 0 to 9, 10 to 19, and so on up to 90 plus. And then over here, we have the number of comorbidities that somebody might have ranging from zero to one to two to three to more than four. And we can see here that if, you're, uh, if you were anywhere uh, from age of 40 to 49 and you didn't have any comorbidities, the chance of death was under 1% here. Uh, secondarily, if you were between the ages of 50 and uh, 79, oh, sorry, geez, I misread that whole thing right there. Um, sorry, even if you had um, more than four comorbidities, if you were in this under uh, zero to nine group, they didn't record any deaths here. Sorry, m misrepresented that. And they didn't record any deaths here, and they didn't record any deaths here, and they didn't record any deaths here. So, so very, very low mortality, um, just, you know, um, small numbers of deaths here and here, okay? And uh, so this would be the percentage right here. So that's a rough closing in on 1% right there. Um, and the mortality, if you were 90 plus and you had more than four comorbidities down here, was 52%, right? So um, very, very uh, uh, strong chance of dying if you were up here, uh, 90 plus. But regardless of how many comorbidities you had, it was pretty strong when you're 90 plus. Uh, 80 to 89, again, pretty strong, but a, a good advantage if you had zero comorbidities. 70, 79, 
very strong correlation with comorbidities from, ranging from uh, 28% down to 5%. Same thing from 60 to 69. You would go from 1 to 9% based on your comorbidities. All right, so that's a pretty cool way to look at this. It basically says we can control this a little bit. So if you know that the honey badger virus is coming and sweeping through your country, you know that you can take your old, elderly, and people with comorbidities and put them, um, get them out of harm's way and or uh, give them uh, better supportive care. All right, and for the slightly less good news here, um, this is also from that same paper, kind of cool. Uh, all the test positive cases here, then... Uh, but you are test positive, but you were hospitalized. And then how many ended up fatal? So you can sort of see the fatality down here in the red spreading through um, out here. And uh, you see that 50% uh, death rate here on this final one out here between 95 and 100. What's uh, slightly less good news about this, though, is look at how many hospitalized people there are. So I want you to try and imagine a percentage um, that this occupies. So let's just look at one here that's pretty easy to do. Let's hear it from 70 to 75. Roughly speaking, half the people tested positive. The other half of the people who tested positive ended up either in the hospital or dying. Um, all the way down at this end, it, it's pretty much um, nobody ended up hospitalized. Very, very few down um, in this end right here. So let's look at this in table form. And here's the table that, that has all that data. I don't want you to read this whole table. Just a couple things out of this. So um, what did they do here? They had uh, SARS-CoV-2 test negative individuals. So there's 219,158 negatives out there. And here was the age distribution of those people who tested negative. Here's the 9,500 who tested positive, And you can see um, just how many of these tested positive here. Here's the distribution in percentage terms right down that column. 78% of them were community managed, meaning you basically got better at home. And then 22% were hospitalized. So this is an important thing because this is where the sort of less good news comes in because we know that people who are hospitalized end up having a pretty bad run of it and that there are lots of uh, seemingly long lasting effects for people, kidneys, heart, lung, neurological or brain tissue, right? So, so we've uh, been talking about a lot of those over time. And so that's a pretty big deal. If you say that one in five, I'm just rounding off crazy, like crazy here. If one in five of the people who actually test positive end up going to the hospital, that means one in five who test positive are going to have fairly long-term consequences um, from this as a, as, a, as a higher probability for them. All right. So that's a, that's, those are some pretty big numbers right there. Breaking it down further, of those who are hospitalized, how many were in the non-ICU versus the ICU? So this is 22%, 19% were uh, just non-ICU, 3.2% ended up in the ICU out of that uh, 22% right there. And then 5.5% ended up fatal within 30 days. But again, very, very heavily clustered down at this end with zeros recorded through all of these um, age groups uh, up here through about 30. So this is the Denmark experience. Other places have slightly different experiences, but here's why this is the less good news. When you look at the number of people who get this and the number of people, these are all up here. These are all in the green. These are all the mild cases, the so-called, these, these are what we call mild, but we know that these mild cases are still sometimes having a pretty bad run of it. As well, everybody who's down here in the, um, call it sort of a I don't know, peachy color right down here. The hospitalized cases, they also have a much higher chance of having a pretty bad run of this on a long haul kind of a basis. So we've covered this data quite a bit, but just as a quick review, how many are actually impacted by a long lasting impairment? Well, this comes from August 3rd. We find out that there's high odds of severe COVID-19. So that means you've been in the hospital, can lead to kidney injury or even failure. Uh, and so that's approximately, what a wide, wide range here. Let's see if we can hopefully tighten this up in the future. Approximately 10 to 50% of patients, again, pretty wide range, with severe COVID-19 that go into intensive care may have a kidney failure that requires some form of dialysis. At Mount Sinai, 46% of patients were admitted to the hospital with COVID-19 since the beginning of the pandemic had some form of acute kidney injury. And of those, 17% required urgent dialysis. Now, kidney damage, sometimes that's repairable, sometimes it's not. But it's it's pretty bad deal if your kidneys get um, damaged to the point of requiring dialysis. That can speak to really a, a fairly lifelong injury there, uh, potentially. 
Many, this is a disturbing part here, had no underlying health or kidney issues prior to the virus. So kidney issues. Um, this, uh, on July 31st, this came out, you know, from brain fog, people report to heart damage, all this stuff. We're talking here about COVID-19's lingering problems. They actually alarmed the scientists. I cut out a bunch at the beginning, but here's the paragraph I wanted to talk to you about. It says, the likelihood of a patient developing persistent symptoms is hard to pin down because different studies track different outcomes, follow survivors for different lengths of time. One group in Italy found that 87% of a patient cohort hospitalized for acute COVID-19 was still struggling two months later. 87%, yikes. Data from the COVID symptom study, which uses an app into which millions of people in the United States, UK, Sweden have tapped their symptoms, suggests 10 to 15% of people, including some mild cases, don't recover, don't quickly recover. But with the crisis just months old, no one knows how far into the future symptoms will endure and whether COVID-19 will prompt the onset of chronic diseases. We don't know that, but the heart damage data doesn't look that good. Neither does the uh, lung scarring uh, and the kidney damage. None of those look very favorable right now. So let's use, uh, let's just hold these numbers. Let's just, let's just imagine 10 to 15% of people, um, including some with mild cases, uh, end up with some sort of a, a long-lasting thing. And when we look at that, we understand that um, this was in uh, New York Times just on August 3rd talking about how the COVID long-term toll signals billions in healthcare costs ahead. So yes, uh, 50 to 280 billion in, in healthcare costs, but the other impacts like people who are no longer able to work and aren't productive and uh, put more strains on their family systems and support networks, uh, all of those are, are not actually captured in this gross sort of um, billions of dollars cost. But yes, absolutely, we're seeing this, you know, here's somebody who's had a headache since April, never stopped running a low grade temperature, just, you know, out of the game out of the game. And uh, this woman has uh, throat, head, eyes hurt, muscles, joints ached, all of that stuff. Felt like she's in a fog. Fairly typical symptoms for a long hauler. And, uh, you know, this person's four months later, four months she's been struggling with this and these symptoms remain. So yeah, lots and lots of costs around that, which again, so, you know, the deaths um, are one thing here. And that's pretty cool that the deaths are falling. Let me take some of this junk out of the way so we can see him again. Um, but yeah, so the deaths are one thing, but we can't just measure this particular illness in just deaths. Uh, we have to also consider all of these people who are in these fogs and uh, some sort of long-term impairment that might be as high as 10 to 15% of people, maybe even higher, 87%, according to the Italian data, but uh, those are all hospitalized people. So let's just run those numbers very quickly. Let's assume that there's 10 to 15% of people who uh, test positive who have long-term issues. Let's imagine out of a global population of 7.8 billion, 80% get infected. Let's just imagine that that happens. That means you're gonna have you know hundreds of millions of people with long-term health issues. For the United States, particularly uh, with a population of around 320 million, if 80% get infected, you might have, I don't know, 26 to 38 million with long-term health issues. But actually, let's let's put some more reasonable numbers in there. Let's imagine it is 10 to 15% with long-term issues, but 45% have no symptoms at all, so we have to you know just dial everything way back. 80% infected, but you know roughly half of them like eh, nothing happens. Um, in that case, the numbers still back off to you know 400 to 600 million worldwide, um, and 17 to 25 million in the United States with long-term health issues. It's just these are staggering, staggering numbers. So so that's sort of the slightly less good news, but hopefully. Once we've gotten to this herd immunity, we aren't getting new cases, and that's that. And maybe everybody who's been affected has already been affected. Maybe we can take these other numbers I just presented and dial them even further back. Maybe everybody who's going to be infected more or less already is, and we're just down to this is these, this low, low flat tail down here is just sort of mopping up the last few people who can be exposed. Who knows? Uh, but certainly that's what we're seeing maybe in London, which is down to zero here uh, pretty much. So hey, maybe that's the case. Maybe that's how this all looks. You know, uh, Sweden is, is heading very rapidly down towards uh, uh, these case counts are just plummeting here right now. So that's the theory um, that maybe this has already burned through and it's going to burn through um, relatively quickly. And that'll be that. So that that's pretty good news. Now, against that, we have to be honest about the unknowns. We don't know how long the illness is going to persist for these long haulers. Uh, that's certainly true. We just don't know that at this point in time. To add to that, we're going to also say we don't know whether or not this immunity is going to last. So maybe we got herd immunity now, 
but maybe that goes away in six months because, hey, coronaviruses, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, they, for whatever reason, the body doesn't um, maintain a persistent antibody response against coronaviruses. Maybe this one will be different. We don't know. And we also don't know whether or not a subsequent second infection is going to be milder or more severe. We've presented some evidence that there have been secondary infections. Maybe it's just the the virus remaining latent and firing back up again. I don't know which is worse, to be honest. Um, but people who are getting a second infection are reporting it as being bad um, and sometimes worse. And to add to that, we don't know whether or not this virus is going to mutate eventually into a strain that's going to evade whatever existing immunity, herd immunity we may have, sort of like the flu. That's what the flu does. It mutates every year, re-scrambles its, its surface coat proteins, that's why we have to make a new flu vaccine every year. And that's what it does. Coronaviruses are different, a little bit more stable than that. Um, but as well, this thing is sweeping all over the world with a uh, law of big numbers in play. So, you know, once you're in a billion people, the chance of mutating is, is pretty high just by uh, the law of numbers. And then finally, um, we don't know whether or not a lasting a vaccine will be developed that will confer lasting protection. And coupled to that is bullet point three, talking about whether that subsequent infection may be milder or more severe. If it turns out that antibody-dependent enhancement, ADE, is part of the game with uh, this coronavirus, it means that there's a chance that the second infection will actually be worse than the first. So these are all just unknowns. We don't know how any of this is going to play out yet. But the way we are looking at this data right now says whether you're Sweden uh, whether you're Spain, I see Italy here, uh, whether you're in London, whether you're in New York, whether you're uh, Mauritania, you know, whether you're uh, Armenia, everybody's seeing the same sort of behavior where the honey badger virus comes, sweeps through your population, and then uh, runs out of uh, apparent victims. All right, so that's really what we're seeing against these unknowns. Put all that in there. I'm pretty confident that this thing is... Uh, on the way out in terms of sweeping across the population. Will we still have to deal with it? Yes. Are people still going to be coming down with this? Yes. Should you still be careful about this? Absolutely. Should you make sure that the terrain of your body is as healthy as it can be for this and other viruses? Of course. Lots of things uh, come out of this that don't change, but uh, the constant uh, fear and lockdown uh, talk that's happening continually is, uh, I think it's now doing more harm than good. So let's go there for just a second. First, there's been profound economic and now social damage. This is just some United States statistics, but this could be Europe. This could be, I think, Japan soon as well. Um, but at any rate, uh, we saw the U.S. gross domestic product GDP falls by a historic 32.9%. Historic, meaning record. Never saw a fall like that. That was in the second quarter. We had millions of people still losing their jobs each week. Uh, and so this is uh, tens of millions of jobs area under that particular curve. We're also seeing that um, these are uh, tightening loan standards at banks. And so this was the height of it all at um, 2008 in the great financial crisis, 2008 and 9. We're back there. Um, so uh, this means that small and medium-sized businesses in particular, those that can't just tap the giant corporate bond markets or even sell their bonds straight to the Federal Reserve like uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Apple did, um, you know, then uh, what's happening is uh, companies are being really starved for cash. Banks are not making these loans. Without those loans, lots of businesses go underwater for liquidity issues. And Against that, we saw recently that 32% of households, that includes renters and mortgage payments, mortgage payers, missed their July housing payments, either completely or in part. People are making the decision between insulin or groceries. Uh, people just struggling all over the, the country. So even as uh, average households are really struggling as small and medium-sized enterprises are just getting crushed by this whole thing, well, the Federal Reserve saw fit to uh, go ahead and um, and make the NASDAQ hit all-time new highs. That was a specific policy of theirs. They've also made bonds hit all-time new highs. Gold is hitting a new high. Uh, so for people who hold those sorts of assets, which, by the way, is preferentially the top 10%, which is even more preferentially the top 1%, it's even more preferentially the top 0.1%, uh, they're doing fantastic. The billionaires are just doing fantastically in this whole thing because that's who the Federal Reserve decided to bail out. They said, 
they said money for Main Street, but what they really meant was they're going to give it to Wall Street and to the very, very rich. And that's what they've done. And that creates social instability. That creates the, the conditions for protests, for riots. And by the way, I consider households not paying their mortgage payments a form of protest, maybe one of the more effective forms of protest. Protesting doesn't mean getting shot with rubber bullets out on a street at midnight. It could mean something as simple as saying, you know what? I see the very wealthy getting bailed out and they're getting bailed out, so screw it. I'm not going to send in my uh, mortgage check this month. That's a form of protest. I don't know how much of this is protest happening here and how much of that is people just saying, yeah, I'm done playing this game uh, the way it's been set out at this point in time. But that's simply uh, due to the fact that the Federal Reserve has uh, set the conditions for that deep unfairness. If you've watched some of my earlier videos, watch the ones about the capuchin monkeys being fed grapes versus cucumbers for performing similar tasks. Us primates really, really don't like unfairness, structural unfairness. What the Fed is doing is preferentially saying winners and losers, we're going to pick. The winners in this story are going to be the billionaires and the mega corporations. The losers is pretty much going to be the 99% on down. What they don't know is that that means we are all losers at the end, including the 0.1% and all of that. I don't know how they can't figure that out, but uh, when your society crumbles because... Uh, you've destroyed the social fabric uh, through policies, nobody wins. Nobody. So I don't know why the Fed thinks they can pick winners and losers when, in fact, uh, they're actually picking everybody to fall, slip into the, into the L column at some point. So the conclusions for today are whether or not you lock down SARS-2, a.k.a. HB19, Honey Badger Virus 19, it's going to sweep through your population. That's just going to happen. And a certain percentage of the people are going to be really severely impacted or even die. And a competent culture would say, we're going to help take care of those people. We're going to have a plan. Not, you know, if 98, 99% of us have no impacts, whatever, but that 1% to 2% really do, how are we going to step up as a nation to help those people, those long haulers, the people with lifelong, uh, possible lifelong impairments to major organ systems? How are we going to help them? How are we going to um, help support them in this time of need? Um so that's just something I think you just have to be ready to handle as a, as a culture. But then, you know what, uh, honey badger, it goes away. And for how long, we don't know. I mean, is it going to come back in a mutated form? Does it mean that, you know, our antibodies go away in a year? Everybody faces being reinfected again? We don't know. Um, so a lot of unknowns that we're going to have to figure out. In the meantime, let's continue to be safe. Let's continue to uh, keep up, you know, reasonable social distancing, mask wearing, and other things like that just to help uh, keep this thing at bay. But given all that, therefore, I think the lockdowns are creating far more damage than the virus that they are meant to address. I think that the government printing money and handing it out to lots and lots of people rather than allowing and getting people back to work is a mistake. Uh, printed money leads to all sorts of bad things, including, you know, record speculation in stock markets and the rich getting richer and uh, all sorts of things. And eventually, ripping inflation, rip, rip, roaring inflation, right? Um, and that that's a da very damaging thing. So that's my point of view right now. The lockdowns are actually uh, worse than uh, what they're trying to correct at this point in time. Worst of all in all of this is central banks, specifically the U.S. Federal Reserve. They've made everything more unfair and socially unstable by rewarding the already rich, the well-connected and powerful with lots of their thin air money. So what do I mean by that? If you don't know what I mean, thin air money means that when a central bank like the Federal Reserve puts money out into the marketplace and buys up mortgage-backed securities and treasury bonds and corporate bonds and all that stuff, they don't have money sitting around. They go clickety-clickety-click on their keyboard and they make money out of thin air and credit that money into uh, the bank accounts of whoever it is they're buying those assets from and then they buy the assets and then all the assets go up in price and then the people who hold the assets get richer. Boom. That's how it works. Uh, and uh, But that's just a terrible, terrible social policy. It's awful. It's uh, really not going to help long term. And um, because of that, I think this isn't going to really end well. SARS-2 or no SARS-2, uh, our powers that be seem unable to do anything other than to jam the stock market higher and make bonds more expensive and therefore lower rates of interest available to everybody. And meanwhile, uh, bank loans to Average people and small and medium-sized businesses are drying up at record pace. And, of course, all of that could be controlled as a matter of policy. But the central bank, uh, the Federal Reserve, and uh, Congress and the Senate have no interest in doing that because, my opinion, um, th there's no cost to them to continue to uh, support their benefactors with uh, thin air money and, and policy decisions, things like that. 
All of which means if you're an average person like me, you're on your own, really. Um, <coughs> excuse me. It's up to you to figure out how you're going to face the future. And uh, this is all now very much afoot. And I don't think there's any way to, to turn back the game at this point in time. And you know what? Didn't have to be this way. It really didn't. Uh, there, this was all very easily predictable. Lots of things we could have done. Uh, it's, it's very clear what we even should be doing today to be correcting this whole thing. And, um, you know, obviously if it was up to me, if it was up to me, I would, uh, I would send everybody in whatever country uh, I was the leader of would get a care package that would have all sorts of vitamins and things in it. The care package might look a lot like this. You would have uh, elderberry syrup in it. You would have this N-acetylcysteine and vitamin C powder. And you'd have quercetin and zinc and D3 and selenium and other things like this that all we know that we know help create a proper terrain in your body so that if you do get sick, you have a less severe run of it. And we know that there's good solid data now around things like vitamin D3, solid, that says it really helps. And so that would be step one. Everybody gets that so that even if, if my people in my land did manage, you know, did get sick anyway, maybe they, for certain some percentage of them would have a, a less severe run of it or a more mild case to contend with. So that's better, right? And then two, if anybody did experience symptomology or they got exposed, we would have hydroxychloroquine available uh, with zinc, with azithromycin, um, because we know that given early, given within uh, less than two days, but better yet within one day of symptom onset, then we know that um, these people actually do a lot better. And then if they did progress into the hospital, we would use the Math Plus protocol as soon as possible. That would be methyl prednisone and uh, the steroid use and the heparin to control the clotting. And if they went further than that, if people got even more sick than that, we would then progress them to the more experimental, the more expensive uh, monoclonal antibody treatments like the ones that go against uh, IL-6, things like that. But that would be how I would approach this. And, um, and then I think we, you would have a much, much more mild run of it. Tell everybody to wear a mask, wash their hands, social distancing, and we can all get back to work. Boom, done. I, I think that's, that's how we go around all of this. So if you like that story, remember, um, you can get a t-shirt, join this movement, the resilience movement. It's all about what makes sense and, uh, uh, logic and reason and things like that. And look at all these great people we have who've, uh, sent in their t-shirts. If you get the t-shirt, and you send a pic to this address, info at peakprosperity.com. We will put this up on our Instagram page, which is right there. And uh, see your smiling face up there with everybody else. Fantastic. Remember, if you have a garden, it's time to harvest it now. It's too late to plant one in most places, but it is time to harvest that garden. Again, get your immune booster stuff out there. You're going to love it. And if you have to, remember to resubscribe to this channel because people get unsubscribed all the time because I do very, very dangerous countercultural things like say i don't agree with these people um that seems to get me in trouble so whatever i gotta do what i gotta do because to me it's a matter of integrity to bring you as close to the truth as i can find it at that point in time remember if the facts change i'll change my opinion along the way and uh, certainly you can see the if you've been following me you can see the evolution of coming to this theory now of how this thing just seems to come sweep through and go i presented it before but i just wanted to really lock down this thinking for you today all right, that is all I have for you today. Thank you very much for listening, and we will see you again on Thursday, August 6th, for another installment. Thank you very much for listening. Bye-bye. Hi, folks. This is Adam Taggart, Chris's co-founder at Peak Prosperity. To get your own resilient shirt, simply go to peakprosperity.com slash shirts. Each shirt is made of 100% organic cotton and produced in the USA. And when your shirt arrives... Please send us a photo of you wearing it if you feel comfortable doing so. We'll add you to our wall of proud Peak Prosperity members who are showing the world that resilience is the way to a better future. Thanks for watching.